recording again. And let me share a screen. <coughs> and this. Okay, and I presume people hear me. And if not, somebody will raise a hand or something. All right, but you still hear me, John? I do. Yep. So I'm presuming that everybody else will as well. So we'll give people a few minutes to wander in. Because last time it was people were wandering in until, you know, like three minutes after the hour. Oh, yeah. Well, that's how it was with classes too yeah i was gonna say i think we've gotten worse about that on zoom we're just like oh we can schedule right up to noon and then go to something else at noon and forget that no we really can't go back to back that way there's a reason right. classes at the college are 10 minutes apart and... <laughs> yeah. oh, well. So let's now, so presume you see the big slide. You don't see the notes, right? I see the big time series and the traffics. That's good enough, then. Yes. I have done this correctly. Yes. It looks like I can allow them to talk. Do you want me to? Yeah, that's fine. I mean, even though we have the hour, I try to make sure I, I try to get between like 30 and 40 minutes worth of stuff so we can have chance for these side conversations and questions and things like that as necessary. Okay, we'll give them about another minute and we'll get going, folks. Okay, so I think we've waited <clears throat> till long enough afternoon, at least noon my time, 10 your time. Um, welcome everybody to the second in our series of um, method seminars. Today we're going to talk about time series and we're going to talk about attractors. Um, to understand resilience or really any dynamic process in social networks, we've got to have some time series data. Um, but time series in real systems, time series data, they tend to be noisy. Um, and their patterns hence are very noisy, um, almost to the point of being ideographic. And so we have to look at new ways to identify patterns to get at patterns of things. Um, so that's what we'll do today. Um, there's a little bit of um, a plug here for the future things. Since nonlinear thinking is different than linear thinking, we have a series of these things. Um, and each time we're gonna look at different ways of thinking about situations, not so much how to do it, but why should you care about it and what's different and things like this um, to provide you some new lenses to look through. Uh, we'll do one the first Friday of each month in the academic year, so the eight months that people meet. Um, there'll also be a summer school. If you really wanna know how to do these things and not just to think about them, um, there'll be a couple of week-long summer schools next summer. Um, the first one is in May and it's intended for students, specifically the trauma track students, but other students can attend as well. Tentatively, and this is very tentative, we think that the trauma track students get to do this for free if they want. Um, and we'll try to keep the cost very, very low because I know students have so much money. Um, the general audience one will be in July. 
So today we'll look a little bit at regressions and just highlight some things. You know how to do regressions. You know how to do most of these things. Um, you understand about most predictive stuff. Um, and we'll look at the issues there. Um, the second part, we'll look at what state spaces are and how we can work with data in state space. And then the third part, we'll talk about trajectories and tra attractors. Uh, we'll have a discussion at the end as necessary. And certainly if you have questions, you can put them in the chat. Um, John here apparently is gonna monitor the chat for us a little bit. Um, or just interrupt, right? Raise your hand, ask a question. I think you can all talk. So <clears throat> let's talk about linear regressions. And these are really exogenous regressions. That's the important piece. Um, the assumptions that go along with this, as you know, are your data points are independent of one another. But there's also some other assumptions that you may not always think about so clearly. One of them is that the causality of a system is assumed to be external to that system. That is, you have something outside which influences something on the inside. Um, you also assume that this system is some signal plus some noise, right? Every time you write a regression equation, there's always that little funny epsilon or E or whatever you variable you use at the end, which is just your uncertainty, it's your noise, it's your error term. <clears throat> the goal of these things always is prediction. You want to be able to predict this. That's why we call it predictive modeling. The epistemology, that is how we know what it, we know and why we know it and things like that, is really nomothetic. You're looking for principles of things. You're looking for the truth of how these things are related. Um, in practice, we can do nonlinear, but it's much trickier than linear. Um, in principle, it's the same stuff. You assume independence of data, you have external causality and things like that. So it works out. We can also do something known as autoregression, which is less frequently known. Um, but it considers what happens when you have time series for real. Um, and if you think about what happens next year, that's not independent of what happened this year. And so we build the model not based on, is it 2021, but based on what happened the previous year and the year before that. Um, in this way, we sort of use endogenous, not exogenous modeling. And we don't assume that things happen because it's 2021. We assume things happen because something happened last year. And so there are different ways we can look at this. Many of you, probably all of you from your high school days are familiar with some compound interest formula, right? The amount of money I have in the bank at some year depends upon how much money I had initially, and then one plus the interest rate raised to however many years I left it there. But that's not really what happens. Really what happens is the amount of money I have next year is gonna be the amount of money I have this year times this interest rate, one plus this interest rate. And notice, if I do this year after year after year, I get the original formula, but really what's happening is this one down below. And so we say this is an autoregressive model, and we say it's an autoregressive model with one time lag, um, which produces the same thing as the compound interest formula. So in the results, in the predictions, it's the same. However, it's not really the same in what you're thinking, right? One is thinking endogenously, one is thinking exogenously. And economists do stuff like this all the time with much more complicated stuff. And it turns out their predictive ability is pretty much zero because they have much, much more complex stuff. So we can build on this. And there are lots of descendants of this. And there, one of those descendants is the cross-lag panels model and sometimes called Granger causality models. And these things have descendants themselves. You have this group iterative model, multiple model estimation and all these others. These differ mostly in power sensitivity and things like that, but effectively, they're just building on this and saying, hey, can we model next year or next time sequence based on this time? Um, I wanna look at one of the multi-level vector, multi -level vector autoregressions. And this comes from Green's paper in 2018. So here's um, PTSD networks during a conflict and each of these numbers corresponds to a question. So for example, question number six happens to be, you know, is avoid, how much do you avoid thoughts, right? Are you trying to avoid thoughts? And 10 is how much you're blaming self or others. And 11 is how much do you have negative trauma related emotions? So these are just questions off of EMA data. You'll notice that in the contemporaneous stuff that you look day to day, 10 and 11 are well correlated as are 10 and six. However, if you look from day to day, you'll notice that 10 produces or at least indicates that 11 is gonna go down the next day whereas an increase in 10 indicates that six is gonna go down the next day. So things that are correlated well day to day actually have an inverse correlation when we think across days, okay? So contemporaneous correlations, lag correlations, not the same. 
And all these approaches are good. They're all of them mostly better than the current standard sort of just regression inference approach, approaches. The good news is they're not too far away from those regression approaches, so they're still acceptable to reviewers. You don't have to spend a lot of time saying, hey, look, this really is legitimate. And they're becoming more mainstream. We get relationships between variables. It's regression after all. We get some predictive ability, what's going to happen in the future. Um, and in these newer methods or these more advanced methods, we differentiate between the contemporaneous and the sequential. However, there are issues. The biggest one happens to be epistemological. And Edgar Morin put it this way, when we're referring to the epistemology of classical science, he says, when one searches for the laws of complexity, that is one tries to make predictions based on the data, one still attaches complexity as a kind of wagon behind the truth locomotive, that which produces laws. And you, un, you avoid the fundamental problem in all of this, which is epistemological. Okay? We're trying to say, this is what's happening. It doesn't work so well. So there's a mismatch then between the methods we use sometimes and the subjects we use them on. The methods are extraneous causality, predominantly, even in the um, autoregressive piece. There are independence of data points, although autoregression starts to get beyond this. Prediction, but autoregression doesn't get beyond that. And the framework is that you have some signal plus some noise, and that works out great. However, your subjects, and we're normally talking about humans here, they have endogenous dynamics. What happens to me is what's going on inside of me. It's not just what happened to me from the outside. There's a dependence of the data points on previous data points. And the goal here is really not to predict my actions tomorrow or later today. It's to understand what's going on so that I can intervene. Right? In this frame, in this case, the framework of signal plus noise, it doesn't work very well at all. Okay? And Morin was pointing some of that out in later writings. There's also a practical issue. Here's some data taken from a time series. And the best fit line is shown in blue. And if you look at that line very carefully, you'll see that it's basically the average plus some noise. Okay? And if you do an auto regression, you get the same thing. You find out that it's basically the average plus noise. And the average here isn't exactly 0.5. If you do the calculations, it's 0.49. Okay, the slope is not significant. However, I can do some magic. The magic is this. I'm going to take that exact same data set, but I'm going to plot it on different axes. And lo and behold, now it looks some, something you can interpret. This looks to be and is a nice parabola. Okay, and looking at what it was, you'll notice the first data point happens to be 0.7. And so you can go over here, the first data point, 0.7, you go up here, it's 0.81. And then the next data set, next data point would be 0.81. The problem is you can't do prediction with this. You may understand how that data comes about, but it turns out to be impossible because any minor deviation on this first data point, within about the first 10 to 20 data points, you will have completely lost any semblance of the pattern. Okay, so we can understand things but we can't predict. And this is the big deal, right? Prediction is impossible in most nonlinear systems, even though understanding is possible. So that was sort of the quick highlights or lowlights of regression. I'm gonna stop and if there are questions there, um, let's talk about this for a moment. So any questions to this point? Okay, so it seems like we're good so far. So what can we do instead to promote understanding? If we throw out this idea of prediction, we throw out trying to find the laws and say, how can we understand the system? What can we do instead? Turns out one of the things we can do is to look at what's called state space. So let's consider n measures and whatever those might be that describe the entity. So for example, when you go into the doctor's office, you get blood pressure and heart rate and respiration rate and height and weight. And that tells you the state of the system. And they're expecting certain things there, right? If you go in and your blood pressure is 240 over 200, they're gonna instantly take you to the hospital, okay? Um, likewise, if your blood pressure is too low, they're gonna start thinking something's wrong, okay? So that measures the state, how healthy you are. Um, you could do that with weather. We could take the temperature and we could take the humidity and we could take um, the amount of cloud cover, whatever. But we don't want to look at single measures. A single measure 
is a bad measure, um, especially for systems that are human systems. Um, I once failed a uh, physical because they looked at my blood pressure and my heart rate, my respiration rate, my height, my weight, and they said, those can't be possible. They took a single measurement and they said, he can't do that. Um, this was back when I was in my 20s and I was in really, really good shape. Um, and so they sent somebody back out to take the measurements again. And they found out, no, those were the right measurements. And so then they said, okay, fine, he passes. But they only found that because they looked over time, not at a single measurement. And so the classic example, the place this sort of started to take off was Edward Lorenz back in the 1960s was modeling weather. And so he had some equations that he developed that modeled weather. And what he found was something like this. If you start with a point here, here's what happens to those three variables over time. It spins around here for a while, and then it comes over here, and comes back over here and does this. This is a very odd pattern. And if you were to think about taking data on this, you would find lots of variation. But notice, it's not just random variation. This is a definite pattern here, okay? In order to use Lorenz's method, you need the equations, right? You need to have some equations that you can create the data from. Um, you may also wanna see this paper by Lo Schiavo et al. Um, Chip Benight was in on this one where they were looking at triadic um, reciprocal determinism. But you may also want to, instead of looking at things this way, you may wanna be able to get the equations from your data. Um, a recent paper by Chu did that. There's another way you can do this. Suppose you have categorical data instead of continuous data, okay? And incidentally, if you're gonna do this, you need really good categories, which is much, much harder than you think. We always use categorical data, but we just don't really stop to think usually, is this any good? And it turns out that most of our categories really aren't that good. Here's an example from a, a paper that was done. And there's a practitioner, it's really a clinician and a patient. And the categories off topic, listening, short response, asking a question or elaboration. And you'll notice that this looks fairly symmetric between the patient and the practitioner. Right? It basically like, oh, they ask a question over here, we get a little elaboration, asks a question, goes over here, a little elaboration, asks a question, and they go back and forth in this sort of figure eight type thing. And so this sort of state space grid can be used sometimes to help us see patterns that we might not otherwise see. <clears throat> now, I need to say something about how we measure time in all of this. Time, it turns out, really can be conceived of continuously or discreetly. In Lorenz, it was continuous, right? At every possible moment, there was something going on. However, in the example I just showed you, it was discrete. Right? It was basically taking turns. I talk, you talk, or the practitioner talks, the patient talks, the practitioner talks, the patient talks. Okay? And so we had discrete time. Um, in May 1976, which is where the data that my magic trick came from, it's also discrete. You have this period, and then you have the time, the, the data at the next time period, and the next time period, and so on. And this matters. We often make discrete measures of continuous time variables. If you think about it, my emotion is continuous. I always have an emotion, but we only measure it once a day or once an hour or whatever it is. Um, this may be unavoidable perhaps, but we need to sort of keep it in the back of our mind because it's gonna create problems. So if we wanna do things with this sort of state space approach, there are three mainstream approaches. One is we can create a state space from delays. That's effectively what I did with May's data, with my magic trick. The delay was one and I created a state space, right? Two dimensions and I put the data there, it looked better. We can create a state space from a vector of measurements like Lorenz did. He used three, we could use whatever we wanted. We can also create a state space from categorical data as we saw with the state space grids. Okay, so there are three mainstream approaches they had used. Um, there's also a fourth one that we can try. And this is an attractor and trajectory approach. And I'll talk about what attractors and trajectories really mean um, shortly. But this follows from a categorical data approach to time series analysis. It basically combines clustering followed by some time series analysis. And you can use sort of your standard clustering if you want, hierarchical k-means, doesn't matter. And then from the transitions from cluster to cluster, sort of like on the state space grid, 
we can get different time series. You can do things like a growth mixture model. You can do a light and growth curve model, things that you may have seen before. We can do other stuff as well. Okay, so we'll look at these four approaches, three plus one. So here's a first example. This data came from out of Chapman University, and they're looking at infants learning to walk. So here's an infant, infant within the first couple of days of having learned to walk, taking those first steps. And what we've plotted here is an ankle angle, and what we have here is a knee angle. And you don't really see a lot of a pattern here. And it just looks like lots of squiggly lines, like a kid drew something. But let's wait a week or two. You wait a week or two, and notice what we see. We see something that goes like this. Okay? And it's not exactly this every time, and it's not the same every time, but we see a rough pattern. And notice we also see this little hitch down here at the beginning. Right? And that seems to be pretty constant every time you see a hitch. And lo and behold, I can say it's probably four steps because we go up and around once, and we go up and around a second time, and a third time, and a fourth time. So we get four steps there. And indeed, this was measuring four. It was actually about four and a half steps. You'll see that it looks very, very messy here. But these parts look pretty smooth. And these parts look pretty smooth. It's only at those ends where it gets a little wobbly. Here, notice it's wobbly all over the place. So we can create a state space vector for walking. And this, I just arbitrarily picked the ankle and the knee because those happen to be the first two listed. Um, and put this together. Do we just need two measurements to really pick off how, how kids learn to walk? Probably not. The data set has many more measures. I just picked two because it'll be easy to see, right? I can display a two-dimensional graph and because the patterns pop out. Um, it turns out it doesn't matter which two I pick, you'll see the same thing. Squiggles for the beginning walker. And after a couple of weeks, the walker starts to experience things where you see a pattern. If we were to watch you walk for most of us, we would see these, except they would be almost completely overlapping at every time. So we could create the state's place from the delays. <clears throat> With the example I showed, I cheated. I knew what the answer was before I created the data. Without cheating, you get approximate help, and I do mean just approximate help, from a field of math known as algebraic topology. You'll hear things like Tocken's embedding theorem and false nearest neighbors and autocorrelation and mutual information. You don't want to ask, because if you ask me, I have to say things like the transformations GT form a one parameter group of diffeomorphisms. And if you want to talk about one parameter groups of diffeomorphisms, we can, but probably one or both of us are going to get embarrassed if we try to do that. However, all of this, all of the algebraic topology means that we can take advantage of two important factors. The first is that a complex systems dynamics are holistic. Right? There are echoes of the entire system in every state variable. So even if, though a person is a very multidimensional entity, and we need, I don't know, 90, 100 different dimensions to measure a person, if you were to measure one dimension of a person, you would probably see echoes of all the other 89 to 99 dimensions. Okay? And that's very important because we assume that there's a holism, we can use stuff to help us out. The other thing we can use is that nearby points sort of unfold in the right dimensional space to be not near one another. And we can use that to help us out, right? If you think about it, think about putting up a tent for camping, right? When you show up at the campsite, your tent is all folded up or rolled up or whatever, and you have points that are right next to each other. So the floor is right next to the ceiling. However, if you unfold it, all of a sudden, the floor is not next to the ceiling, and you get this nice pattern, a pattern that looks like a tent, that you can actually do something with. So all of this stuff that you may hear about for embedding and delays and false nearest neighbors, all of that stuff is just trying to help us with these two things. The fact that there are echoes of the whole system dynamics in each state variable, and we can unfold things in the right dimension to produce the right pattern. So <clears throat> go back to the walking example can choose one variable. I happen to choose the ankle. Okay? And if I do the Tocken's theorem and the false nearest neighbors and everything, it says that I should embed that in fewer than four dimensions and with a delay less than 34. Well, notice that's not really a lot of help. Okay? I know I need four or fewer dimensions. Great. Delay is 34. Exactly what delay should I use? Um, it turns out 
probably doesn't matter. Some pictures will be cleaner than others, but you really don't need to worry about it so much. So this graph is the same data as the graph that we showed on the right, the experienced walker walking, okay? except notice we just have two arbitrary variables. We have where they were at one point, and it turns out where they were 33, um, 33 frames earlier, because this was video data. And you'll see sort of the same thing. You'll see that there is this pattern. It goes like this. It's not as clean as it was on the original one because of the way the, this works, but we still see those two sort of loops at the ends of things. So we see you're going here, and there's a loop here, and then up and across and down, there's a loop here and back like this. And again, we see the four and a half steps that were taken. So you get back the same information. And notice, this is a great thing. You can use this to figure out, are you missing variables in your theory? I have this great theory, it involves three variables, and I plot things and it doesn't look very good. However, I could use the embedding theorems on the data and find out, oh, wow, it embeds nicely in five dimensions. You wouldn't be able to visualize it, but you could find out that I must be missing two because I thought there were three. The embedding dimension says it's five. There must be two other variables that I haven't thought about including my model. So this can help us understand theory. This can help us produce better theories. State space grids, we've seen this already. Here's a second example. And notice this is more complex than the previous one. And it's not as symmetric, whereas the previous one had this very nice figure eight that went there. This one's got all sorts of other stuff going on too. Okay. And there are things in here that we're not seeing at all. We see some short responses. We see some more listening. We see things like this. Okay. And you'll notice that you follow the arrows. You end up here. You end up here at a place where they're both listening. Right. So this was just the end of the date and neither one was talking. Somebody had obviously, the practitioner had asked the question and they're both just kind of sitting there. Okay. Um, we can have a number of metrics that can be computed to tell us about the difference between this one and some other state-space grid to characterize this. People talk about things like entropy and they talk about deriving Markov matrices and all sorts of stuff. Okay. But each of these three, whether you do it from the vector of things, whether you do it from the delays, or whether you do a state-space grid, can produce patterns that will help us. Now, there are metrics um, beyond this eye test. So far, all we've done is the eyeball test, right? We looked at it and we said, yeah, there's something there. Um, but in each of these, they see things that may be missed by other approaches. In particular, the biggest one is that you see these mesoscale patterns, right? We don't see things at every individual time point. We don't see averages across the entire thing. We see sort of that intermediate steps. We see things that are this long rather than an individual point or the whole data set. And that's something that's often hard to get at because we don't really have a good sense in psychology or indeed most of the social sciences, what's the appropriate time length to look at? Should we look at a second, a day, a year, what? So finding mesoscale patterns is important. We also find patterns that are intermediate right, things that don't happen all the time, okay, even in the infant who was just learning to walk, we were able to see certain things they were able to do, oh, they've gotten down this piece, okay, it turns out that infants, right, if they're laying on their back, they do a lot of kicking, and so the part of the step where you're swinging forward at your knee, that tends to be the thing that, first of all, lines up, okay? and so you'll start seeing that there. We can also, on the flip side, not only see intermediate patterns, we can see significant variations from patterns. We can see where is the wobble in the walk. We can see where are they having trouble, okay? And so all of these things can help us see these mesoscale or intermittent patterns that we otherwise miss. Now, we don't just have to look at things. There are metrics that we can calculate that will tell us what's going on, okay? But rather than talk about the metrics, because this isn't the how-to, we talked about the um, ways we can look at things. So one of the big things that gets used a lot of times is something known as recurrence quantification analysis. That's probably the most common way people find these other metrics. Say, oh, what's going on? But even still in RQA, recurrence quantification analysis, people look at the pictures, see what's happening. So before we move on to attractors and trajectories, 
Um, any questions about sort of the states-based stuff? Okay, so let's talk about attractors and trajectories. So I'm gonna start off with an example of what's called a quote, simple attractor. Um, please be aware, simple attractor doesn't mean it's a simple thing to do and that everybody should understand it. Simple attractor means that in the topological sense, it's simple, right? Meaning it's a single point in the end. And so a child swing, and if you think about any sort of pendulum, but I'll take a child swing, in order to define the state of the swing, you need to know where it is, right? Is it all the way back? Is it all the way forward? Is it hanging down below? And you need to know its velocity because if it's down below, it could be moving forward, it could be moving backwards. So if you have those two things, you can create a state. Since you have two variables, you need a two dimensions. So let's assume I take this swing and I push it all the way to the front. So we'll say the front is one. What happens when I let go? It starts to swing back. That is, it has a negative velocity. And so it swings back until it reaches the zero position, right? And so notice all the time, the velocity is getting further away from zero, meaning it's going faster until it gets to the bottom. Then it starts slowing down. And when it gets all the way to the back, what does it do? It stops and it starts swinging forward. That is, it has a positive velocity. But every time it goes back, unless you're pushing it, it doesn't go quite as far. And so eventually what happens is it slows down, it gets closer and closer, it doesn't have as big a swing till eventually it comes to rest right in the middle with zero velocity. And so this is a simple attractor, this point right at the center. And all of this is known as the basin of attraction, right? Because anything that's in this basin, if you let it go by itself, will eventually end up at that point. Right? And so this is a simple attractor. Social science has very few, if any, simple attractors. We have instead these strange attractors, things like the Lorenz butterfly that we showed, right? It had two wings, they say, as a butterfly, or something like the walking, where we saw something with some loops at the end. So it was kind of triangular with some loops at the end, right? We see these types of strange attractors everywhere, right? So the simple attractor is just saying, you have this and everything nearby gets to this. Whereas a strange attractor says, yes, everything nearby gets to this, but it's not a point. It's some strange shape. Okay, so again, simple just means it's a point. Strange means it's really not. And sometimes there are simple ones that are not points, but they're simple figures like a circle. Okay. So we can talk then about what the attractor is. Okay. And I'm going to do a partially mathematical um, definition. If you tell my mathematics colleagues that I said this, I'll deny it. I don't care that you have a recording. I'm still going to deny it. Um, and I'll define a attractor this way. First of all, your state variables determine the state space axis, right? In the case that we just looked at, the state variables were position and velocity. So those are the axes that we're looking at. An attractor is a bounded region in that space. So we have some space and you have some bounds and the bounds may be nice and regular, the bounds may be not regular, but you have some bounded region. Turns out sometimes if you use discrete um, time, they don't even have to be connected regions. Think back to the first picture state space grid we saw, right? We had a chunk over here and we had a chunk over here, but nothing in between. And so we could say the attractor was these bounded regions to take them together. This is next one is the key to what we're going to do. Measurements, if you take a measurement, you're likely to find somebody in the attractor region and unlikely to find them in between attractors. So think about this. <clears throat> um, I work at home, so I'm not a good example, but my wife works in downtown Rochester and she lives here and she's got like a four and a half mile commute. If you were to just ra at random times, look at her position, what would you find? you'd find most of the time either her position was someplace in the house or the yard or was someplace near her office downtown. If you got really lucky, 
you might find her someplace on I-490 near here, that is, during her commute. But think about it. Almost every time you'd measure where she was, it's going to be here or there. So we could say there are two attractors in this particular system. There's the house attractor, there's the work attractor, and there's these transitions that she makes. Okay? Measurements are likely to be found in the attractor regions, unlikely to be found in between the attractors. Okay? And this will be important. The shape and the location of the attractor depends upon the parameters that tend to be stable or external to the system. That is, parameters always are something that we want to think about as not being part of the system. So for example, back here, what are the parameters that create this? Well, the biggest parameter that creates this is the gravity here on Earth. <clears throat> right? And if you had more gravity, what would happen is you would end up going faster and faster. The other parameter that helps create this is the friction. If you had no friction at all anywhere and no air resistance, you would just have a circle, right? Everything would come back to the beginning. Right? If you had more friction, right? If we put some sandpaper, we put something to sort of break this thing up at the top, or you skid your feet on the ground as you go by, then what you would see is this would go in much more quickly. If you have a parent catching you, you might have an attractor right here at the back. The parent catches you and holds on to you. Okay? So those parameters are things which are external. They're exogenous. Okay? Um, parameter spaces and what attractors, attractors they enable, that's an interesting topic. And that's another huge topic. Um, if you look at the paper, the Loshaivo paper that I referenced earlier, you'll see some work they did with looking at what the parameter spaces are. That is what types of behaviors you can get. <clears throat> so the attractors are made up of trajectories themselves. If you think about the butterfly attractor for Lorenz, it's really a trajectory, right? It's a trajectory that goes around and around and around for a while. But you could make up larger scale trajectories from how people move from attractor to attractor. Right? So you have a little attractor here and you sit here for a while and then eventually you go over here. My wife stays at home until about eight o'clock in the morning. And then what happens? She goes over to work. And then at whatever time in the afternoon, she comes back from work. Okay? And so the trajectory within the house, right? There's bedrooms and kitchens and living rooms and desks and things like this. She has some, some sort of path she wanders through here, some strange attractor here, and then to another attractor. Okay. So not only do we have attractors, but we could have a tra we could have trajectories made up of other tra other attractors. Okay, and that's going to be the other piece that we're going to use here. So pragmatically, let's think about some attractors. Um, the classic example is human locomotion, and this is a classic example because a almost everybody can access this and has some familiarity with it, and b it's got all the right pieces. So. There are lots of attractor states, if you think about human locomotion. If you were to draw these particular graphs, like we drew with the walking, you'd see things like walking and crawling and running. They all look different on these graphs. But these are qualitatively different behaviors. Even if you're not an expert in locomotion, you can differentiate between walking and crawling and running and skipping and all these types of things. You don't need any special thing, any special expertise for this. These are all attractors. They're dynamic, they're not static, right? Walking consists of me moving my legs in certain ways, my ankles and knees and things like that. They're qualitatively different from each other. Again, you can easily see that. They can be changed. And this is an important piece here, right? I can go from walking to running to skipping to whatever. And it doesn't take long if I'm experienced. If I'm four months old, I probably can't skip, okay? Each of these turns out to be a minimum energy given certain constraints. Those constraints are due to the environment, your own abilities, and your intentions. Everybody walks roughly the same way. That is, everybody has the same walking attractor because everybody's walking on a sidewalk. If you walk in sand, you have a different attractor because you have a different environment. Everybody has roughly, most everybody, roughly the same abilities, at least most adults, right? Kids are certainly different. And everybody's got the same intention. If I'm just going from here to there, I'm going to walk. If I'm in a hurry, I may run. Okay, so there are constraints. There are these parameters that combine together to give us some sort of attractor. So that's why we like human locomotion, because it has all these pieces in it. But notice, we spend a relatively long time in any attractor and relatively rapid transitions between them. Okay? 
You could, if you want to put into locomotion, the state of not moving, we could put laying down and sitting and things like that, right? So I'm going to be sitting for this time. I'm sure at about another 20 minutes, I'm going to stand up and, you know, walk to the kitchen. These fact that we can spend a long time in a tractor and then relatively rapidly transition, right? How long does it take me to stand up and start walking? Not long compared to the amount of time I will spend sitting and walking. So we say strange attractors are metastable. They're stable enough to do the job, but they're not so stable that I can't change them very quickly. So stable and meta. So let's talk about this. There's a paper that I'm working on with Heather Littleton, and I think I saw Heather join here um, and Chip about some people who had survived a hurricane and we're looking at the resilience. And there are 42 days of EMA, um, ecological momentary, um, why am I forgetting about the A? Um, so assessment, survey data. So we do things like um, you know, self-efficacy and PTSD and your mood and things. There are 161 people minus missing data, right? That always seems to be the case. And so here's what we did. We created pseudo attractors via clustering. That is, we looked at all of these things and said on day whatever, what was your CSE score and your PTSD score and your support score and things like that. We created pseudo attractors via clustering. And this is kind of arbitrary because this has nothing to do with dynamics. We said we're interested in dynamics, but it works. And it doesn't really matter what um, sort of clustering method you use, you're gonna get basically the same attractors. This effectively creates regions, not points, right? Because if you think about it, what happens is I haven't clustered everybody who's exactly the same. I cluster people who are sort of the same. And so I've got this region that's an attractor. Okay, so there's an attractor. Um, and there's a little bit of bonus there, the imprecision of the instruments, the fact that, you know, does a three on a PTSD question mean the same for you as it does for me, or is your three my four, something like that? When you cluster, you kind of, push those issues to the side a little bit. So it doesn't matter so much. But once we've done this clustering, we'll see that some of these regions are frequently visited. That is, we see them a lot of times in the data and some are rarely visited. So we can call these attractors and transitions. Turns out that we created 14 clusters. Eight of those clusters accounted for 99.5% of all the data and we have 4,000 plus data points. Six transitions then account for less than half a percent of the data. And I don't mean each of the six is less than half percent. I mean the total of those six. These six then are really transition clusters, right? They're catching somebody in between their house and their work. And then we can create trajectories of those attractors. Each person then, and we didn't group by person before we found the, the attractors, the clusters of attractors, is a certain, each person is assumed to be part of some recovery trajectory. And it's really sort of a meta trajectory, right? because we're measuring with EMA, we measured every day. And within the day, they probably had ups and downs and moods and you know their self-efficacy and things like that. And we found four trajectories. There were some other ones, but they tended to be very idiosyncratic. So four of them kind of for about 72% of the data. And you can find these trajectories. You can do it via GMM or whatever your favorite thing is. I used Markov matrices and I clustered the Markov matrices. Um, that turns out to be pretty close to what GMM does, but not exactly. Um, and we found four of these things. One of them was a trajectory of mostly stable adjustment, people who were mostly stable and they did okay. We found some unstable adjustment people who had active recovery efforts. They were trying, but it just, you know, they kept getting better and then worse and then better and worse. And then this happened and whatever. We found some less successful recovery efforts, people who were never really in good health. And we found some fluctuating adjustments. And there are some advantages to doing this sort of two-step thing rather than just jumping in and saying, oh, let me do a GMM or whatever. Okay. First is we get both states and trajectories. And this is sometimes more clinically useful or theoretically useful because it has both the static part and the dynamic part. And we're used to talking about the statics in psychology and in most social sciences. Okay. And so by having the attractor, we can say, oh, this is what's going on here now. We're not thinking that, oh, you're getting better, you're getting worse. We're thinking, what are you doing right now? Um, it's a little bit more uncertain, uh, honest about the uncertainty in the data collection instruments. Again, is your answer of three equal to my answer of three? Okay, probably not. 
The other thing that this does is it gives us a better sense of the mesoscale patterns, right? A lot of times things like GMM and stuff, they're just saying, oh yeah, we have this one and it's much different than this. This allows us to look at these mesoscale transitions, these short but not individual measurement time scales, right? And so I'll give you a couple examples. Here is the example of a mostly stable adjustment. So the way we've done this is here are the eight clusters that we said account for about 99.5% of things. Here's the most healthy, the second most healthy, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, seventh, and here's the least healthy. And these people were basically, for the most part, were spending a lot of time going from this particular um, state, to this particular state, and back. Okay. And you'll notice P is probably the best measure of health, at least it's a decent single number to measure health by. You know, so going from like 0.44 to 0.3. And these are all done as Z scores just to make it easier to compare. Occasionally, somebody would jump down over here, do something like this, or occasionally, right, somebody would somehow go from a very low one, they'd manage to get healthy again. And the thicker lines, the darker lines are more frequent as things get to be very thin and or very um, transparent. They're very rare transitions. So we see that for the most part, these people were reasonably healthy, right? Because they're both of these have Z scores for their sort of health above zero. Right? Here's the fluctuating adjustment. First of all, there are fewer of these, it turns out. So overall, the lines are a little bit um, more transparent. But notice, somebody goes here to here, and then they go down over here and back up here and here. There's not any one particular place where we say, yeah, they tend to stay healthy. Okay? These people tend to be someplace. These first three are really sort of the healthy states, and these are the less healthy states. And you'll notice they're not always up here. They're up here a lot, so they're in a healthy state reasonably frequently, but they're also in some of these unhealthy states. There's a fluctuating adjustment. So this gives us a different way to look at some of these things. So the end result is this. State-space approaches are useful. Um, we can find lots of interesting things out about them that will give us ideas about not just these things are different, but what's happening at these intermediate scales. Okay, so that being said, um, are there questions? Comments? A very quiet group today. Ah, somebody shows up in the chat. I, I got time, Steve. We can wait. If, like Steve, you are absorbing and thinking and waiting, you can always reach out to me afterwards. Shoot me an email and we can that's some more about these things. So it doesn't have to be all done by 11 o'clock your time. Okay. So while you're thinking, I'll just mention two things. One of which is next month, we're gonna talk about what's known as catastrophe theory. Um, and catastrophe theory is a branch of topology and no, you don't need to know topology that deals with discontinuous and divergent phenomena. Um, if you think about it, catastrophe theory is a great way of dealing with sudden changes, things like you know, the sudden fight or flight in a system that otherwise seems pretty smooth. And we see a lot of these things, right? You have something and then some threshold gets crossed and boom, somebody does something radically different. Um, these are well known anecdotally, but a lot of times we just characterize them as noisy data or outliers or something. And catastrophe theory can help us get through some of that. Um, so that'll be in December. Um, and in case you're interested, um, I think these are all the references from everything I mentioned at some point in here. Um, so if you had questions about that, you can pull them off here or you can email me at some point and take a look at those. So, 
there are questions, we'll take them. And if not, you'll get a chance to get up and stretch your legs and maybe get to the next meeting on time or the next class or whatever. Okay, then I think we'll leave it at that. And we'll give everybody a chance to, uh, like I said, get to your next meeting, maybe closer to on time, um, or have an extra nine minutes for lunch or something. Well, thank you all for your attendance. Um, and hopefully I'll see you in December. <laughs>